Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Dr. Katya Archambault is our speaker today, and she will be discussing whether or not 3D imaging makes sense for the general dentist. At any point during the webinar, we certainly enc encourage your participation. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A section, section of your control panel, and we'll answer them live at the end of the presentation. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. And this webinar is sponsored by Cable Imaging. So with that, I will throw it over to Dr. Archibald. Thank you so much. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you to Henry Schein and Cable Imaging uh, to invite me doing this webinar. It's a pleasure for me to be with you once again. And we're, we're going to talk today about how CBCT is important in uh, the general dental practice. So let's go ahead. I'm going to uh, introduce myself. So for those who doesn't know me, I'm a board certified oral maxillofacial radiologist. I'm also trained in surgery and I work here in uh, UC San Diego in the Jacob Medical Center. Our office is uh, right next to that building. And uh, so I'm involved here in the head and neck surgery and otorhinolaryngology department and also in the plastic surgery uh, department. So you have here my uh, email uh, and my cell phone. So feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to help my colleagues. And uh, we're going to start with uh, what uh, happened to us yesterday. So yesterday I received some images. You can see here, it's not a CBCT, but it's a multi-detector CT of a young woman of 24 uh, years old. And you can see from those images, being a radiologist, sometimes you don't see the patient clinically. Uh, sometimes you have very little information. So all you have is what radiographs are going to tell you. So you have to listen very well to radiographs when you look at them in 2Ds or in 3Ds because they contain so much information. So what do we have here? We have here on the axial view, you can see that the left orbit is uh, pretty much pushed out huh, of the, the from the face and all that started with a nodontogenic infection, tooth number 15, uh, you can see here. And for those who ask, uh, would want to ask me, why don't you have a PA, uh, Dr. K, or why don't you have a PAN on that patient? Well, she was admitted here at UCSD in the ER, and all they took at the beginning was a uh, multi-detector CT. So we can see here that still there is radiolucency pretty close to the nerve, and basically patient developed in acute sinusitis, we know that sinusitis, 10% of them are from odontogenic origin. So here you can see the inflammatory changes and the infection spread all the way to the epnoid sinus and all the way to the frontal. The sphenoid sinus was also involved. And you have here uh, the involvement and the cellulitis involving even the, the orbit. So that's what the patient looked like clinically, so you can see that they tried to place some drain. I went in the uh, OR, extracted the tooth. So when all the information are combined together, uh, it's a lot easier to see more clearly. And of course, patient at MRI as well, because we're afraid of some involvement of the brain, and it's never a good thing to have infection in your brain. So you can see here on the monitor, the ENT are going to clean the sinus. I extracted the tooth. We have all of the information, all the imaging. So I will also talk to you about how DEXIS is uh, capable of uniting in your office all the 2Ds, the, uh, the, the images that you will take and the CBCTs as well, either from uh, OP3D or from ICAT. So the more information you have as a practitioner, the more information is in the notes, the more imaging that you have that you need, then you're going to be uh, easily, uh, you're going to be able to make the proper treatment for your patient. So there's a lot of application. So for any of you who are involved in implants, in periodontics, any uh, dentists out there that are in extracting impacted teeth, 
patient that present with trauma, cysts or tumor of the jaw, uh, when it comes to TMJ assessment and sinuses, as we just saw, CBCT is becoming more and more involved in dentistry because it's going to give you a lot of information that 2D won't be capable of. So when you have more information, like I said, you will be able to make superior diagnostic Okay, and then you're going to be able to make better decisions, and it will also influence your long-term success. So endo, let's start by the endo. We saw one case of acute abscess and all the way to the orbit. Uh, you have here a patient that present to your office. Okay, the first thing when a patient has a toothache, uh, and if you look at the recommendation of the American Association of Oral Maxillofacial Radiologists, will take will tell you, well, just take a periapical radiograph to assess the apical area of that of the teeth. So it's difficult in that case to see is there anything going on. The patient is not very clear uh, or symptomatology is not clear. So when you have a patient that have a little bit of a typical symptomatology, just go ahead and take a small field of view, CBCT of the area. And that's what, that, that's what uh, was done here on the case. And you can see on the PA here, you see almost nothing, maybe a little bit of widening of the PDL space on that second premolar. But when you look on the 3D images on that case, you can see that there is a fracture on the palatal aspect of the root. There is also internal resorption. Of course, there is a radiolucency at the APCs. There is also inflammation within the maxillary sinus. So it's going to be very difficult to treat that patient with root canal therapy. Uh, the prognostic of that tooth is pretty poor. So if you had started doing your root canal therapy just out of the 2D image, well, you might have got yourself into complication or into an angry patient because this tooth is going to be very difficult to, uh, to keep in the mouth. The patient will have to have that extract. So it's always good when you have all of your information at appointment number one, when you do the exam, then everything that is happening in the mouth of your patient is basically their problem. If you don't take proper uh, documentation, then it becomes very fast your issue. So now that CBCTs are out there, very accessible, uh, it's a very good thing when you have a patient with a little bit of atypical symptomatology, just take a CBCT of the area. I have two cases that I want to share with you, also with a periapical radiolu radiolucency. So that's the case number one. You can see that tooth number seven here demonstrate a, radi a large radiolucency at, it, at its apex, okay? Everybody sees that. And then you have a different patient with the same radiolucency, basically at the epical area up to number seven. Two different patients, two different panoramic radiograph, but two very similar lesion. So on 2D, it's very difficult uh, to, to, uh, to assess is if there is anything else going on there. So you have here the first case, here, the second case, radiolucency is at the apical area of teeth number seven in each case. So the CBCT is going to bring you the buccal palatal in that case information. What's going on on the buccal and the palatal cortices? And that's going to give you a lot of information of what kind of disease is going on. Uh, most of the time we see a radiolucency at the apex. We think, oh, the patient must have a necrotic uh, tooth, we have to do root canal. Sometimes that's that's what's indicated, but sometimes also uh, one of my teacher was always telling me the patient can have as many disease as they are pleased. So that in the case number one, in the MPI, MIP, sorry, uh, reconstruction, we can see here that there is involvement of the buccal cortex. You can see that it's enlarged, it's thin. So there is something going on. There is a pathology there without a doubt, and that pathology is creating expansion. Uh, of course, the vitality tests were done, that tooth was necrotic. So basically you have here a very classical appearance of a, a radicular 
assist in that case. Okay, so you have a hydraulic expansion. If you look at the epicenter of the lesion, it's pretty much where my, my little arrow is right now. So you have an accumulation of fluid there and it's expanding like a cyst, like hydraulic or like basically a balloon that fills itself with water. Okay, and we can see it right there on the different view. I made little drawing here. So you can see pretty much a very symmetrical expansion in all the dimension, buccal, palatal here, mesial, distally, and inferior, superiorly here. There is displacement of the floor of the nasal fossa as well. So that behaves like a cystic lesion. And what is a radicular cyst? Basically, you have those remnants of malaceous, the epithelial cells of malaceous. They are there. There is an inflammatory process going on because the tooth has been going under necrosis. And then that epithelium is going to multiply. So you'll have more and more epithelial cell in the apical area. And what's happening with more and more epithelial cell? Well, Epithelial cells do not have vascularization. So the poor cells that are stuck here in the middle of the lesion are going to be uh, missing nutrients because, you know, the, the, the surrounding blood vessel don't reach all the way at the middle of the lesion and those cells are going to go through apoptosis. So you'll have a, a big amount of dying cells in the middle. So you'll start to have fluids accumulation there and the hydraulic pressure is going to go up the roof in that area. So it's going to attract the fluids of the surrounding tissue. So basically you have a slowly growing uh, lesion containing fluids. We call it a pathologic cavity within the bone and it's surrounded by the epithelial cells because those cells can continue their multiplication because they still have the nutrients from the, the surrounding blood vessels. So in the middle, you'll have an empty something cavity or semi-fluid or even gauge uh, containing some gas. In that case, it's containing fluids and it's surrounded by epithelial cells that are keep enlarging. So that is the definition of a cyst. The second case also, you can see on the PA of that patient, there is a uh, radiolucency at the crown, at the clinical crown level. And same thing, that tooth was also necrotic. So uh, if we look again at the panoramic radiograph of that same patient, we can see that uh, at the, at the, sorry, at the CBCT view of that same patient, you can see the same radiolucency. Huh? It looked pretty much like the case number one. But if you look at the buccal cortex here, you can see that there's almost, almost no expansion. The lesion, if I look at the epicenter, seems, seems to be a little bit more palatal to the apex. So it, the epicenter basically is right there. And if you look here at the axial view from the mesial and the distal dimension, there is, it's pretty large, but there is, there is very little expansion on the buccal cortex. And why is that? Well, maybe that's not a cyst. Maybe that's something else. Okay. It doesn't mean that you have a radiolucency at the apex of the, of a tooth and that that uh, lesion has anything to do with that same tooth. So there's a lot of lesion, benign or malignant, that can superimpose themselves at the apex of a tooth and that will mimic endodont uh, odontogenic uh, lesion. So the patient in that case had more than a, one problem. He had the necrosis, of course. You can see here there's a large decay there. The, the nerve got involved, so he needed a root canal. But there's also something else going on at the apex. So you can see I draw some arrow there. You have on the mesial distal dimension, the yellow arrow. You can see it's much more. It's a, there is more expansion mesial distally than buccal palately. And that after biopsy was confirmed to be a keratocystic odontogenic tumor. 
So just the root canal will not take care of that benign tumor here. It's a benign tumor. So we will have to remove or do a little resection there to get rid of that second problem. So the root canal was performed. The biopsy came back as a KOT. And of course, the lesion was uh, removed. So that's very important. When you have a necrotic tooth, uh, you do the root canal, but it's very important also to do the follow-up uh, a few months later. You take another periapical radiograph in the area and make sure that there is no more uh, radiolucency. If there is still, or if the patient has any different or atypical symptomatology, it's a very good, important thing to do a CT scan to rule out that uh, it's not only the necrosis of the tooth that's creating the problem there. Okay, so why is CBCT getting more and more popular in uh, dental practices? Is that, like I said, if the clinician or the dentist has more information or accurate information, it's going to help you to decide how you're going to treatment plan your, your patient and what are going to be the step to, uh, to make sure that the patient is very well taken care of. Here is another case, okay, same thing. A radiolucency, this time at the apex of that uh, first premolar number five. And uh, that was in 2011, okay? So patient uh, was treated by a, a colleague, uh, had atypical symptomatology there. The tooth was non-vital. It was a partial necrosis because it had maybe, you know, still some sensation upon a cold or uh, warm. And uh, they decided to go ahead and to refer him out to an endodontist, which performed a pretty nice endodontic uh, root canal therapy. And then uh, that is the post-op radiograph of that same area. So June 2011. And uh, then a year later, the dentist did another PA and uh, found that there was still a radiolucency at the apex of tooth number five. So refer the patient again to the, to the endodontist. The endodontist redid the root canal, did a, an apicoectomy at the APCs and uh, wrote in his note that appeared as a large empty space during the surgery. So he thought of maybe a cyst. So life went on. Patient came back to the general dentist a year later and then uh, moved away and got some periapical radiograph at another office. And you can see here that second dentist found out that there was external resorption on the mesial aspect of the second uh, premolar here. So what's going on? There is still that radiolucency. And here again, almost 10 years later, in, two, in 2020, patient ended up here in San Diego. Okay, he lost uh, his job, so he was without insurance for a few years. And he was referred to me by the ENT. And you can see that that lesion is getting pretty big. So we did a biopsy, came back again as a keratocystic odontogenic tumor. So those are more frequent than uh, you think. They account for 10% of the benign tumor of the head and neck. And uh, they happen more than we think. And most of the time they are mistaken for uh, necrotic teeth. Sometimes the, the vitality uh, still respond and uh, the root canal are done. And if you don't follow those very closely, then they can end up being pretty large. So we went ahead and placed a drain. So you can see here after a few weeks uh, that the lesion is slowly shrinking because uh, those are very difficult to get rid of. They have those micro cells at the uh, outer aspect of the lesion. So you have to keep one centimeter margin of resection. So they are kind of difficult to get rid of. Recurrence is pretty high, up to 38 to 40%. And we're trying basically to have the lesion getting smaller. So like this, the, when we will remove everything, we won't, uh, it won't be as morbid for the patient. 
but you can still see here how large that thing uh, grew. And uh, that was over though a period of several years. Okay, so why is that? Because when you're looking basically at the mouth or at the tooth, you're looking at the 3D object and when the x-rays are going to go through that tooth, okay, and uh, be attenuated and ended up on a 2D, well, you have a little bit of distortion that will occur, okay? So you're used to see that smiley face, but in reality, what it is, is those four different objects. That was an a image uh, that was given to me by one of my mentor, Dr. Malia, when I was at UCLA uh, doing my residency. So 2D here, again, I don't know if you saw that, most of the radiologists, all of that funny picture, it went viral after Prince William was uh, pictured here. And you can see that sometimes if you have only one aspect of the story, uh, you can be misled. It did not uh, at all, it was not at all what it seemed. He was talking, in fact, of his three little children. Uh, so here also, our human brain is going to try to connect the dot. When we look at the 2D, we're trying mentally to figure that out in 3D in our brain. But because of differences between the shades of gray, okay, sometimes you can be also misled. So if you look here, we can almost uh, see the a, an inverted apex there but there's no root that is the uh, nasal palate and canal there there's no teeth in that structure but we can almost imagine that there is one so when we're looking at area like the submandibular glands uh, on panoramic sometimes it's not rare that i have dentists referring me some images and they are worried that they might have some disease there but in fact you know it's just like the normal anatomy or sometimes a little bit variant of anatomy uh, and uh, there's nothing going wrong so you won't have that problem when you will look at uh, your cbct because basically your you will see the exact representation of what's going on in your patient head Okay, and uh, I use all, the ca all those cases, I, I document them in DEXIS. So I, uh, I have here a patient that came not too long ago, uh, that was in end of March. Okay, that is a panoramic radiograph that I took. He was complaining of pain in the upper right quadrant. So I took a panoramic radiograph and you can see uh, with a clear view, you know, I can change the appearance of the radiograph. So that is within the DEXIS software. And I also had some uh, periapical taken of that area. I did not take uh, a lot because I, I was going to take a CBCT, which you'll see in a minute. So that is a, a partial FMX there. And uh, here is the area of concern of the patient. So he had pain. So we can see that he has a large decay there and also some radiolucency at the APCs of that endodontically treated tooth. And you can see a little bit of calculus that restoration is a little bit overhang there. I never badmouth anything when I work. It's uh, for me, it's a gold standard. But I told the patient that maybe that tooth could that crown could be redone because there is a little overhang there that uh, can uh, create a problem. And you can change also the the setting so you can play with your contrast but i'm sure that all of you guys are familiar with dexis and i i like to draw so i i show them that he had maybe an unfilled mb2 there and we'll see that it was in fact the case and i also show him that he had a large carious lesion he had also that uh, wisdom tooth number one that was over erupted so I have here a little video where I show you how easy it is to go from the panoramic radiograph back to the FMX and within the 3D software. So we did a li little recording and I have to thank uh, the, the support of uh, Kevo. So when I do webinars, they are always so helpful. So I thank Jordan Rice here. He helped me uh, doing that 
to do that little video so you can see that uh, I showed the patient what's going on with the panoramic. Now I'm going to open up. I took a medium field of view in this case. So like this eight by eight, I can have, you know, a good view of both dentition. So it's easy for me to go ahead and show the patient that they like the volume rendering that you see here. I'm going to press there and I'm going to go through the scan. And the patient, they really love it. And sometimes they take picture of the screen. They show that to their friends. And uh, I'm going just to navigate and reset here the multi-planar reconstruction view. So I, as a radiologist and as a general dentist as well, you have to look at the whole volume. Like you have to look at the whole panoramic radiograph, you have to assess everything and you have to assess everything also on a PA because you're liable of everything going on on that view that you took from the patient. So that applies for 2Ds as well. So I can show him a little bit uh, the decay, even if uh, he has large restoration. So that's not ideal to show dental decay. Uh, the 2D bite wings are still very good. There is also those external bite wing uh, in the pandemic. We, uh, we use that uh, a little bit, but the resolution is not as good uh, on those. You're better off with uh, intraoral bite wing for assessing uh, dental carious lesions. Uh, so you can see here, I'm scrolling through the volume and then I'm going to show on the uh, coronal view, my patient. So I saw uh, a little bit of enlargement of that nasopalatine canal. And uh, then I can take a small measurement. You see it's only like four millimeter. Uh, the threshold for calling it a nasopalatine cyst is going to be uh, 10 millimeters. So I'm going to look at that mesial buccal root of tooth number three, that's the distal. So you can see that the endodontic material ends up all the way to the radiographic apex. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that mesial buccal root. And you'll see that there, there is a non filling to canal. That is my uh, number uh, 16. A little surprise, he had a um, wisdom tooth there impacted and the tooth was inverted. So it was aiming up north, probably aiming to Canada. As you picked up my accent, I'm French Canadian. I'm from Montreal. So that little number 16 is trying to go uh, up north in his mouth. And here you can see. So when I show with that, with my arrow, you can see that the shape of that mesial big buccal root is oval. And you can see that the endodontic filling material is towards the buccal of the root. So when you see things like this, most of the time you have a MB2 canal. So that's a trick. And I'm pointing that out. So it's very nice because, you know, with with all of those tools, like that little arrow, you can make notes on the screen, you can show the patient. So it's a very amazing way of explaining everything that is going on in the patient mouth. Okay, so here we have tooth number one, that is obviously a problem. Tooth number 32 is not there. So that poor wisdom tooth is uh, going south. Uh, needs to be extract. We have an unfilled MB2 canal and residual uh, apical periodontitis there at the APCs of that uh, endodontically treated tooth number three. And we have a large decay on the second premolar. So now I'm going to make my region of interest uh, my mesial buccal root. So I'm reorienting my scan. Okay. Uh, and it's very easy to do with Anatomage. I love that software. I'm working with it every single day. Uh, and uh, I can make nice images. You have the endo. I'm going to do it a little bit also. Uh, so I'm removing here the, the arrow because I want the patient to see better. So when once the patients see something very clearly, they are more prone also to go ahead and uh, commit to treatment. So 
it's hard to see that uh, on a 2D or on the periapical radiograph that that MB2 canal was not filled, you know, because uh, I don't know any dentist that wakes up in the morning and say, oh, today I'm going not to fill all the canal when I'm going to do my root canal. I'm going to make sure I don't fill my MB2 canal. So, you know, most of the time those things happen because we work still on 2D and it's difficult to assess the morphology and all the anatomy of the roots uh, when we don't have 3D. So that uh, the, the dentist that did the endo probably was not aware of the MB2. That, why, that is why it's not filled because we could see it. So it was not calcified. So like I said, you know, as the more information you will have, the better of a dentist you'll be because then you can see and understand everything that is going on okay in radiology like you, i showed you the first case you know they went ahead and do did a uh, multi-detector ct we sometimes we'll use mri we'll use a lot of imaging technology to be able to come and end up with a good diagnosis so here i went in the endo uh window and then i'll show you uh you can get uh rid of some structures uh by just drawing with that little scissor tool and you can see here i made my patient laugh a bit i said okay let's get rid of the tooth so that's obviously not what i want to do i'm getting rid of the whole tooth so now we have no more problem but uh, no. i i will just draw it properly here Okay, and then you can get rid of the surrounding bone and you can make the, the tooth the only object on, 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 that, on that window. So I'm going to get rid of the uh, surrounding bone. I'm going to turn the tooth around and then I'm going to get rid of the bone in the furcation area. And then I'm going to be able to show my patient more precisely that mesial buccal root. And I'm going to be able to measure for the endodontist or the, the general dentist that will retreat that tooth uh, where exactly is located the MB2 canal, okay? Because I'm trained in surgery, but I don't do, that's the only thing I do other than uh, maxillofacial radiology. I'm not doing any root canals. And I have a lot of admiration for those who, who, who do um, root canal because for me, Believe me, I will not be that successful retreating that tooth. You're, you're good at what you do every single day. So radiology and surgery are my two fields. So I'm going to uh, play a little bit with the, the setting here. And uh, here I'm going to make a measurement so I can tell the MB2 canal is right there. I'm going to make a little arrow to help my colleague and then I'm going to make a measurement and they will be able to go reopen that tooth and retreat, uh, hopefully with success, that uh, tooth number three. So I can make them basically a map of exactly where the canal is located. And if I go back to that little icon, the little tooth, and I go back on my 2D and then the patient saw it already in 3D. So I, I show him that, you know, on 2D, you cannot really see the three dimension. And in that mesial buccal root, most of the time there is two canals. So that's why uh, you still have issues there. And you can see very well playing with the contrast, the decay on that second uh, premolar. So it's very easy to jump from one uh, field to the other with the DEXIS. And uh, that's what I do in my office uh, every day. So that's probably me telling again the patient what's going on there, the little varang. So maybe we would be better off changing also the crown. So that will be referred to the prosthodontist. So uh, and then uh, also probably will need root canal, although that there is not still changes there, but that uh, decay is pretty large. And uh, he uh, started also to have a little bit. Of so here you see again, jumping from one view to the other. That's the beauty of Dexis. So it's easy to have everything interconnected 
and for the patient it's easy to understand okay so then you will say well dr k there's a lot of radiation with cbcts well if you have short cone and you don't have rectangular collimation you are exposing already your patient to pretty much a lot of radiation just taking regular fmx that we all do in our office okay uh, basically if you take those it's about four panoramic and you will have with the eight by eight with will which will give you the uh, capability of assessing the maxillary and the mandibular dentition uh, with basically the uh, equivalent of five panoramic. So here again, another table from Dr. Malia, where he showed that uh, full mouth series is around like 177 microsievert of radiation. Okay. And, uh, medium field of view eight by eight basically one so basically it's almost five panoramic radiograph so if you don't have rectangular like i said and uh, you have short cones when you take your fmx you're exposing your patient to more than you're thinking uh, uh, you're exposing to more radiation than you often think you are so the beauty of the cbct uh, i started uh, practicing dentistry in the early 90s so i saw the digitalization of the uh, traditional film and the big uh, big um, revolution is uh, since the early 2000 uh, the the happening of the cbct and now recently it's more and more common that uh, a dental practice will have one in there in their facility. So it's not going to go away. We have to understand that technology is very important to get familiar with this because there's a lot of application and that's what we will see. So basically those units uh, look like a panoramic unit you see here is the OP3D. Uh, so you, can, you have the option of taking a two dimension panoramic radiograph that I have here in the UCSD, the OP3D Pro. I work with that every single day. I love my machine. I can choose what type of view I want. So when you think of endo, you want to have the endo resolution. So you'll take a very small field of view. If I want to assess the whole dentition, then I'll take a medium field of view. Uh, it's pretty rare that you'll need the large field of view. Most of the time it's for orthodontic purposes, you know, and the larger field of view you get, the less resolution you'll get as well. And you have to assess everything that is going on also on on your dicom so it's lot it's a lot more to read so basically what it does it turns around the head of the patient and it's going to take several panoramic uh, radiograph and then the the software is going to put them all together and reconstruct everything and you'll end up with a box of dicom so you can uh, with uh, in vivo, for example, you can cut, you can recreate different panoramic reconstruction, you can do whatever you want with your DICOMs. So the DICOMs, like I said, are going to be put into anatomage for you. So when you saw my DEXIS, I'm going through anatomage and uh, back and forth. So Warren Buffett said once that the best investment you can make is in yourself. So with the uh, av availability of the three dimension uh, Im images in dentistry, uh, it will help you and uh, me also to be one, two dentists because we're, we have a better assessment of what's going on in the patient mouth. And it's going to be very beneficial for yourself, for your practice, for your treatment plans, for your patient, and for you as a uh, as a uh, health provider. Okay, like I said, OP3D, you have that amazing feature when you where you can choose the different field of view for different applications in dentistry. The other sometimes. Uh, comment I get, well, I'm afraid to miss pathology. As you saw already in the presentation earlier, radiolucency at APCs of teeth might look like a dental abscess, granulomas, or, or cyst. Of course, you need histology to differentiate the three, but sometimes it can be KOTs. We saw two already, okay? So here is another case you can see. Uh, 
the patient had pain, got on antibiotics, and it went away. I'm sure you guys see thousands of those a year in your offices. So 2D doesn't show really a lot. Being radiologist, I can see that there's a little bit of widening. Probably you guys saw that also, widening at the apex of that second premolar. But you have to think, when you uh, orient your cone and you're taking ex uh, your radiograph, if the cone is a little bit oblique like that, even if there is loss of bone there, it might be overimposed with the apex of your tooth. So you won't see it on the 2D. So here is the 3D of that same patient because the dentist went ahead, did a good thing, took a, a, a CBCT. And now, you know, you can see uh, that there is a very evidently a radiolucency at the apex of that tooth. So went ahead, treated the tooth, happy doctor, happy patient, happy story. Okay, so we know that we don't see a lot of uh, radiolucencies when we take two dimension radiograph. And we know that if you go back in time with Bender and Seltzer, they did that study in the early 60s, they took cadavers and they drilled holes and then they took radiograph of those same jaw. And you can see here that when there is only one of the, cor the two cortex involved, it's very difficult to see that on 2D. And if you like to read, then you just Google Patel and all. There is a lot of literature about how many uh, apical radiolucency are missed on 2D. Uh, it comes up most of the time with 25 to 28% of patient walking around with necrotic teeth, they're not aware of that because you don't see that on you, your 2Ds. So we're used to see an FMX like that. We know now that they, you're exposing your patient to a lot of radiation doing that. And it's going to bring you information, of course, but you know, not as much information as you would get from a CBCT. And now we're seeing slowly things changing and sometimes doing two PAs and jumping to a CBCT medium field of view. Uh, with the pandemic, like I said, you know, uh, we wanted to be less and less involved in the mouth uh, and uh, things are starting to shift a little bit. Uh, you can see here FMX like you see every single day in your office. And uh, sometimes, I don't know for you guys, but you know, when you're in the, 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 the heat of the moment in the practice, you go, you have a patient waiting, you have an emergency, you have something uh, to deal with your front desk, you have your hygiene that is uh, late by 30 minutes, you just go in and out of the operatory, look at the FMX, this is a healthy 32 years old patient going to the dentist, to your office, let's say every uh, six to 12 months, and oh, you see a little bit of calculus there. Maybe, you know, it should be flossing a little bit more. And you go out of the operatory because you don't have time or you're squeezing your schedule. And it's very easy to see. It's very easy not to see that something is going on here on the left aspect. You know, the good thing with radiology is once you see it, it's sitting there and then it looks at you. But before seeing it, sometimes it's easy to miss what the brain doesn't know. So you always have to look at the outline of the sinus. You, you see here, we don't see that. That patient, non-smoker, nothing in, in his medical history, doesn't drink, the perfect patient, a PhD from Berkeley, actually, super bright kid, you know, healthy, doing sport, the perfect patient. And look what's happening here. Well, what's happening there was a squamous cell carcinoma within his left sinus. So you can see here, uh, he went and had, of course, resection of his cancer, went through radiation. That's the bone graft that was placed. The bone graft unfortunately failed. And then you have him. The first time I saw him in my office, he told me, you know what? I always went to my dentist regularly, always floss, always brush and look now, never had one cavity in my life and I lost all my teeth. And you see those patients, we, we did reconstruct him with the help of the maxillofacial prosthodontist, Dr. Crystallis, with who I work here. Okay, so he did a prosthetic uh, reconstruction 
appliance there, but you can see a few months after the radiation and everything, you can see that now is left orbit is sinking in. Okay, that happens a lot. You saw my little girl with the abscess also, the, the orbit was sinking in a little bit. So when you have very, very big uh, malignant lesion in the sinus, most of the time it's going to go all the way up to the floor of the orbit, which is the roof of the sinus. And that kid will have to have a reconstruction. So though they go through a lot, it's not nice to get a head and neck cancer. Those happen more than you think. It's not necessarily the, when I was back in the early nineties in dental school, they were telling us, oh, those are like in their late fifties, uh, drinkers, smoker, bad edge, you know, you have a lot of HPV, uh, uh, head and neck cancer. We treat a lot of them here in San Diego. I'm treating actually a 14 years old right now, 14 years old. So always look at the sinuses. That FMX, by the way, was taken nine months before the patient started to have symptomatology. So when you have carcinomas within the antrum, sometimes there is no symptoms. They start to have a little symptoms. They are a little stuff. You know, they go to their general practitioner, gets on some antibiotics, some sinus medication, doesn't go away. And then you end up, you know, with a terrible thing. So here, when you look at your panoramic radiograph, basically you look at two CEPH and one anteroposterior radiograph. So there's a lot of distortion, a lot of overimposition. Here, kids are renowned to put things in their nose. That one put the 25 cents in his nose. So you can see him on the CEPH. You can see him here, same patient on the panoramic. He did not uh, invest his 25 cents into Bitcoins and became twice richer. That's the same radiograph, but everything that is in the middle of the head on panoramic, as you all know, is imaged twice. So will appear twice on your radiograph. So it is not because you're used to see something that uh, it makes it uh, free of disease. So you can miss a lot of stuff on 2D. Here, I put those funny picture. Everybody, it's easy to see that there's something wrong. So if you have like a cystic lesion with a lot of cortication or things that are easy to catch, it's easy to see. But here you might get distracted and not see that uh, that lady is going to fall in a few seconds within the pool. So Sometimes, you know, we're used, we feel comfortable, we feel in our security zone, zone of safety, because that's all we look and that's all we've been looking all of our life. But there's a lot of distortion here. The good news with CBCT, you can draw the focal throat and so you don't have miss uh, patient that are malpositioned within the machine if you're taking a CBCT. Implants, it is in my head. A must if you're planning to do implants on a patient and I know I've placed myself implants since the uh, since 2000 so I've placed a lot I would say thousands of implants without CBCTs because in those early days we did not have access to that uh, got the first CBCTs like in 2006 so we've placed hundreds and hundreds and still thousands of implants are placed without CBCT but I advise you that if something is not right, if something happens, if something goes wrong, you know, the liability insurance are so expensive now. It's so expensive to defend a dentist that did implants without 3D. Please just just take one, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry. So here I find that very funny. Okay, uh, relax, David, it's a small surgery, don't panic. So the patients say, oh, my name is not David. No, I'm David. You don't want to be David here. Okay, so again, distortion, if the mandibular canal runs more buccally or lingually, they will look differently on the pan. In that case, you'll be more shy, you will place a shorter implant, but here, you know, if your uh, mandibular canal runs there, you'll think it's lower than it is in reality. And look here, those are cases uh, that, uh, th that's a case that I took, you know, long, long time ago when I first had my first CBCT, I placed those implants and look here, I was lucky, you see? 
no paresthesia, nothing. But you know, I'm telling you, uh, and there's a lot of people that have been lucky. I never had a never had paresthesia in my old career. I'm touching wood here, but you know what? Sometimes we played with fire. So don't don't be always be safe than sorry. Okay. So I'm telling you, after that one, I took CBCTs on all my other implant patients. Here I'll also we're not only afraid of paresthesia with, when we do implant. And I mean, if you look at Albrechtson here, studies in 1986 of success of implant, you know, it doesn't mean that the patient is not numb, that you did a great job. You know, here, of course, in that area of the maxilla, uh, that is a successful implant. And there is no radiolucency, no movement, no pain, nothing. Everything is good. Uh, but, you know, when you look, a disaster that implant was very well osteointegrated so this is the the implant case so that was restored by uh, dr cristalis with who i work here but that is what we had that's the temporary here that's the implant and you can see that the the buckle the buckle plate is uh, is deficient there so we had a buckle plate but what we did is we just augmented the soft tissue in that area to make a nicer uh, a nicer outcome of the patient. So the implant was good. When you have an implant like this, you know, either you restart everything or you put it to sleep. But I'm telling you, all implants that are going to be malpositioned, if you know the Murphy's Law, will osteointegrate, at least uh, uh, from what I see on radiograph. So, you know, you want to have aesthetic implant success okay that's what the patient are looking for everybody uh, lift their lips uh, and they are going to look at the area where you place the implant of course when it's the, in the aesthetic zone when i started placing implant they were saying ah oh, up to the first premolar but i'm telling you even second molar patient now they look you have to have success and with cbct and with treatment planning you have the dtx studio now you have the implant studio it's so easy to treatment plan starting from the top the crown and all the way backwards so like this you'll have a happy patient you won't get into trouble you can do a guided surgery if you see in the back here we have the 3d printer we print all of our guides now so i'm telling you don't don't uh, risk anything it's not worth it trauma also so easy to explain that kid when i was at ucla uh at trauma, so it's easy to explain what's going on. You know, we have a alveolar fracture here, okay? And that tooth will have to be splint. And we can see here, the root canal was done. So it's easy to sit with the parents, with the patient. Uh, when they, they are kids, uh, you can look at the TMJ. Is there any condylar fracture? You have all of your information, and then you can go ahead and treatment plan properly. I like that uh, book, The Art of Choosing. What you see determines how you will interpret the world, which in turn influences what you expect of the world and how you expect the story of your life to unfold. So as dentists, we want to have everything to be able to interpret what's going on with that patient and see how the treatment will unfold and we don't want so patients are young do i take cbct dr k my patients are young also so you see here that gentleman had severe uh, pain in the tmj area he was on muscle relaxant as uh, the um, occlusal guard that was done so he ended up in our office in ucsd and i look on his, um, on, I took a CBCT. I did not take right away a panoramic. You know, I went straight ahead to the CBCT, assessed the TMJ area, and look what I saw: a mixed density lesion inferiorly uh, to the mandibular canal. At and uh, he was on muscle relax. And I told him, get off all of those medication. Just keep the. Uh, ibuprofen the paint was going away with ibuprofen so my three major uh differential in that case was maybe a small osteosarcoma osteoblastoma or osteodosteoma and it ended up uh, you can see here i took a smaller field of view to assess in much 
more detail, higher resolution. And you can see here. So we went ahead uh, in the OR uh, with the surgeon and uh, we did ex very conservative. So we were able to preserve the mandibular canals the canal there so the patient did not lose his uh, lip sensation and uh, of course we are always aware with the facial nerve also we don't want a patient that is not able to smile on that side took away the 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 the, the lesion area and you know ended up from the lab uh, being an osteoidosteoma so that surgery was done uh, September 11, September 10, he was able to defend his thesis. He was PhD, like I said, at UCSD because uh, his mind was not foggy by all the medication opioids he was on. So, uh, and now he's working in, in Texas. Here is another case. You see a uh, patient had braces, felt that they had a little change in his occlusion, went to see is a dentist and uh, had severe osteoarthritic changes on the right TMJ and had pain on the left. So uh, uh, he, he, he was referred here to me to take a CBCT. The dentist wanted to assess the, the TMJ area. He was very concerned about the right. But when I took the CBCT scan, I saw something on the uh, cortical outline there. So I went ahead, took a smaller field of view, and look what we have here. Okay, so uh, we have an osteochondroma there. So that was what was creating the change in his occlusion. You have something growing on the top of the condyle here, so the old mandible will shift, of course. So the dentist was super happy because a patient was thinking of getting back to braces and uh, believe me we have braces for a long time because the problem was here okay and not because the teeth were moving so cbct and impacted teeth very important as long or as soon as you see any overimposition with the apc's of the teeth and the mandibular canal you should take a cbct in that case the mandibular canal was running or coursing buccally, okay? So it's far away from the apex. But uh, you know, when you have impacted teeth, those teeth are prone to develop a lot of problems, okay? And uh, I'm not talking about decay of the wisdom tooth or resorption of the distal aspect of the second uh, molar here. I'm talking about five to 8% of those teeth that will develop pathologies such as cyst or tumor, either benign or malignant tumor. And yes, you heard me well, five to 8% of those impacted teeth will end up with bad, bad uh, news. So here's a case, 21 years old, wonderful young patient, you know, did not go to the dentist in a while, had an impacted tooth. Last appointment was maybe four years ago. You know, uh, when you're a student, sometimes you don't have insurance or, you know, it's a luxury sometimes to go to the dentist. We all know that. So poor thing did not go and look when she was referred here to our department, that wisdom tooth is going in forward, very displaced. And uh, we took a biopsy, ended up being a myxoma, odontogenic myxoma uh, associated with that impacted tooth number 70. And uh, you can see there is like resorption, movement, displacement of those teeth. And it was going all the way from the inferior border to the uh, sigmoid notch here involving the anterior aspect of the, the ramus basically it was a pretty large invasive lesion myxomas a little bit like KOTs. it's very difficult to get rid of them they are like viscous in density so we have to take a little bit like ameloblastomas as well margin when you remove them so here again ended up doing a resection so that's a fibula graph because it's so large we're going to 
take the bone from the fibula. I work with a team, of course. I'm not the one that is pre, uh, that is getting the bone from the fibula. Those are vascular surgeon ENT that we have here in the department. So did the surgery with my colleagues. The treatment plan also for the reconstruction is done with the Max Pros. So me, I'm the one that plays the implant basically. So that's the leg, that's the fibula, that's the skin, that's the vessel, and that's uh, us. Uh, putting it back in 3D again, like I said, now we're printing a lot of stuff in the house and uh, I, I will place those two implants here. Uh, so at the time of resection. So everything is done the same day, the implants are there. That patient won't have to have radiation because it's a benign tumor, but still, okay, uh, very devastating for those kids, you know, and they're not losing your TMJ, your F of your mandible, uh, here it's still the swelling, you know, uh, it's very sad, you know, ideally when you have a patient, impacted teeth, it's almost like a, a, a yearly ticket, you know, I, I, it's like a, you, you get a membership at the dental office, you really have to follow them radiographically uh, every uh, every year and a half to two years to make sure that there's nothing that is developing with that within that uh, impacted uh, tooth, okay? Patient that goes through cancer, you know, even though if they're cancer free, we remove, we are able to reconstruct with implants, still have to go to radiation therapy. It's very difficult. Many, many uh, appointments, they get all those side effects. I help them during that. So it's so important diagnosis. So I know you have your clinical information, you're used to your uh, bite wings, your PAs, you're used to your pans, but think that sometimes 2D is not enough. And when it's not enough, well, it's time for 3D. So 3D can be a little bit intimidating. I agree with you. But uh, we have here a mini residence at UCSD. The next one is going to be in October. And you spend three days with me where I go over everything that you need to know, uh, starting from manipulating your dicoms to making images, the benign lesion, malignancies, how to recognize them, the cysts, uh, we go over anatomy, we review uh, the disease, the most common disease. I'm not going to talk to you about disease that you will never see, but uh, things that are pretty common uh, in a general practice. And you can make an ama amazing image that was uh, all done with Anatoma. So that's an amazing software. Uh, here is where our education center is. So we call it San Diego Dental Education Center. You can find us online. So I hope that you enjoyed the hour that we spent together. I hope that you understood uh, a little bit more of the application of CBCT in your daily practice. Uh, and like I said, uh, I will be more than happy to welcome you here in San Diego. And uh, hope that uh, you had a good time and uh, that you uh, did not uh, get uh, uh, too worried about my French accent. Unfortunately, that's something I'm not capable of losing. So I will always speak with my typical French accent. Okay, so I don't know if we have any questions. Yes, we do. Thank you. Um, we've got one question here. So I want to add CBCT to my practice, but I would like to, I would like more training for myself and my staff. Do you recommend purchasing a machine and getting the associated training or should I get the training prior to investing in the machine? Well, uh, uh, I would, I would say, uh, Sorry, I'm still in the office, so that's why I'm, I'm going to. So sometimes the patients are talking loud, so I'll send the. Uh, okay, so that's a very great question, actually. Uh, I would recommend, okay, to uh, get the training first uh, because uh, you will be able to uh, use that machine so much more. You can go ahead and get and get the, the machine first and then use like, for example, with OP3D or OP3D Pro, you can take a panoramic radiograph and then, you know, uh, 
there is a lot of uh, classes out there. If you go on our website, uh, you know, sometimes I, I give what we call like Zoom days and now that things are opening up, you know, there's a lot of training that we, uh, if you're not too far from San Diego, if you want to enjoy a, a beautiful, you know, weekend in La Jolla, you can uh, fly in and uh, I, I give a lot of lecture on, for example, everything that you need to do to know for wisdom teeth, for example. So the whole day we talk about wisdom teeth. I do the same thing with TMJ. So there is training available out there. You can buy the machine, use it with the 2D and slowly get involved. Or you can go ahead and get the training like a mini residency, like the one I give here. And uh, after that three day, you're capable of using uh, your CBCT in all the field of dentistry. So, uh, but I would definitely jump on the technology. So that's a great question. Hopefully I, I was able to answer it well for you. Great question indeed. And the only question. <laughs> Good. Uh, Good. So, probably because everything was clear or exactly, is a French accent. <laughs> exactly. No, it was, a, it was a great presentation. I always enjoy them. Good. Um, Cool. Uh, so there's a question that came in. Are there any specific machines you recommended? I know you're high on Cabo. Um, don't know if you want to expand. You know, out, out there, uh, you know, there's a lot of amazing, that's a great question. There's a lot of amazing units out there. What's very important where, when you're choosing a, a machine, a CBCT, because it's a big investment, although that the price went down when I got my first CBC in 2006, it was almost uh, $250,000. Uh, so prices went down, uh, thank God. Uh, the thing that you really have to look for is software. How at ease are you with the software that comes with the machine? I work as a maxillofacial radiologist with Anatomash. That's my working horse because there's so much option that you can do with it. As you saw in the presentation, there is endo implant, and now it's all interconnected with DTX implant studio. You can print your guide. You know, you can uh, store your image with. Uh, Dexis, it's easy to go back and forth. So for me, that was a great asset. And uh, Anatomage is pretty expensive. It's uh, close to 10,000 bucks. So if you get any other machine that is not a uh, iCat or Cavo, then you have to buy that software separately. Uh, and some software are very limited. You know, you cannot really rotate your images or uh, they, they don't offer you uh, as many image uh, as it is possible to create with anatomy. So if you want to draw the airway or if you want to look at the TMJ on one screen, you know, you're not capable of doing so. So I end up sometimes seeing a dentist that have other machine buying anatomy separately, you know? So that's the second thing. So the price is a, an issue. The software is, is also something to consider, okay? The third thing that is very important is the service. If ever something goes down in the office, the machine doesn't work. When you call, is there anybody that will answer your phone? You know, so there's sometimes machines that are less expensive, but they have zero technical support. So that's very important. And uh, uh, with Cable, I'm very blessed that way because anytime, if ever anything happens, I, I'm able to talk to somebody, you know, very fast. So the support is nice, you know. So that's something in your area that you have to consider. So how do you like the software with that specific machine? Uh, Price-wise, is it making any sense for you? And third, uh, the service that you are going to get with the machine. I had to threaten ending the webinar and all the questions are coming in. So this is great. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. I said I had to threaten canceling the webinar and all the questions are coming in. Um, for a general practitioner, do you suggest the OP3D or the OP3D Pro? I think that OP3D is a very good uh, unit. OP3D Pro will give you the option of taking a larger field of view. So uh, if let's say you're doing any uh, uh, Invisalign or any orthodontic uh, treatment in your office, maybe the OP3D Pro because it gives you the, uh, the option of taking a large field of view is a good investment. And uh, you know, you, you pay by, basically it's like real estate, okay? So you pay uh, 
you paid from the image that you're capable of producing from your unit. So if the price difference is not too much uh, for you, I would recommend to get the OP3D Pro because if you get the OP3D, then you know you won't be able to make larger field of view. If you're doing mainly endo implants and you never ever need a large field of view, then OP3D is amazing, you know? So it's always, what do you do? Are you more like endo? Or are you more like uh, orthodontic driven in your office? But uh, both of the units are great. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Excellent. And then if you know, do you know the approximate cost of what a cable C CBCT is going for? I I know the cost of not having it. Let's put it that way. Okay, how much will it cost you? Let's say you, you place the implant with the donor or you miss a pathology because you don't see it in 2D and then somebody else, I always say, you know what? Uh, the life is, uh, life is uh, funny that way. If you don't have a CBCT in your office, somebody else will sooner or later, if something goes wrong, you'll see the 3D image of your patient or of your procedure. So uh, I think that uh, how much does it cost you not to have the possibility of seeing something in 3D when more and more recommendation coming from the uh, American uh, Association of Oral Maxillofacial Radiologists, or if you look at the American Association of Endodontists, uh, or you know orthodontists as well, uh, there is more and more indication. Uh, CBCTs, like I said, are going to be in our uh, landscape forever. You know, we're not going to go away from that technology. It's going to be more and more involved. So I think it's a very good thing to buy the machine. Basically, if you're taking, I don't know, let's 10 or 20 pans panoramic radiograph a month, you know, and you charge, you know, 120 or $150 for a panoramic or insurance are covering part of it, uh, you know, it, it's not hard to meet uh, the, 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 the price of the CBCT unit. Unfortunately, I don't know exactly. Uh, if it was just for me, I will give it to all of my colleagues for free, but that's something you can talk with Cable about. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, but um, like I said, if you need it, you did not have it sometimes you know you'll regret it and uh, it's more expensive sometimes not to have the image than to have to make the monthly payment good answer <laughs> <laughs> uh let's see what fee do you charge for a ct scan versus a full mouth scan um if you do and then do you do it on every patient okay that's a very great question and that's very personal to every physician. Let's say, for example, okay, like I said, I'm doing surgery and I'm doing all maxillofacial radiology, but uh, we have an endodontist here and we have a uh, prosthodontist uh, as well. So let's say, for example, the endodontist starts a root canal. He's in my office, of course, uh, and uh, then he comes and he say, you know what, uh, Katia, uh, the anatomy of the tooth is more complicated or I feel that there is calcification there, even if I'm with my microscope, you know, I would really need to have a uh, 3D. We're not going to charge that to the patient. We're going to do it because it's the treatment started. And uh, instead of getting into complication, we'll just tell the patient, you know what, Mrs. Smith, uh, for whatever reason, you know, we would need more uh, detail on the, on the anatomy of that tooth, for example, that we're treating okay, uh, right now, and we're not going to charge you. We, we need to have more information on that mesial buccal root, for example. Let's say the same patient, you know, would come, or a different patient with the same uh, root canal for tooth number three, and then the, uh, the uh, endodontist say, oh, I'll, I'll need a CBCT to treat that tooth. If it's, if it's discussed at the patient first exam, Okay, at the first appointment that we will need, then we'll charge. Uh, usually it will be like 240 to 350 for both jaw. Okay, so it's if it's during a surgery, for example, uh, and uh, you, you feel like, oh my God, the, I feel like the nerve is closed of the APCs of number 17. 
just stop, take a CBCT, make sure that you're not going to get into trouble. Oh, of course, if you can do that at the day of the exam, if you see, like I said, any overposition of your APCs with the mandibular canal, you should take a CBCT. But if you have to stop your procedure and take the image, the images, take the radiograph that I would, in our office, we don't charge for it. At the day of the exam, first day, 250 per arch. If it's the full mouth, uh, we're going to do like uh, 350. And uh, if it's during treatment, we'll do it pro bono. So it's different if a patient is, you know, sometimes we have here patients that don't have insurance, uh, like the, the, the so sometimes we do pro bono treatment. Of course, I'll take CBCs, I won't charge it, but you should be able to charge at the day of the exam. There are so many indications now, like you saw, wisdom teeth, endo. Uh, you could go ahead and charge it. The patient, they understand. You show them a CBCT that you have as an example, you know, and uh, you show them how much more you can see. And patients are excited. You have to understand that technology is something that it's exciting for a patient to go to your office. Okay, patients are more likely to quit your practice if they feel that nothing evolves, if it's old technology. Uh, 3D printing right now, you know, you don't know how many patients are excited about that. Are you 3D printing? They, sometimes they ask me, oh, are you 3D printing? And, uh, you know, so it's something that will make your office more appealing to them. It's very rare that I have a patient that will say, you know what, I don't need a CBCT. Well, you know, sometimes it's better to see, like we say, the back of the head one time than the face coming back. You know, you have those patients that you look at the schedule, they're scheduled for next Wednesday, and you get that stomach cramp and you're like, oh no, my God, not that one again. Probably it never happens to you, but it, it did. It, it happens here in San Diego, you know. Uh, so sometimes it's better to see the back of the face one time. If you know, you have to like all of your patients, but it's not all the patient that will necessarily like you. So good fit. If you feel like you need more information, the patient doesn't cannot afford the CBCT. Most of the time, they cannot afford complication. Okay, so it's better, like I say, to see the back of the head one time and then uh, refer them to another colleague or, you know, refer them somewhere else. Great. Well, thank you everyone for the questions. I think we will end there for the night. And of course, thank you, Dr. Archambault as well for your fantastic presentation. If anyone has additional questions on CBCT and or if you'd like to add it to your practice, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com or you can email Dr. Archambault directly with any additional questions. If anyone would like to attend future Henry Shine webinars, visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming schedule. This webinar was recorded, so we'll send you a recording within one week of today. Thank you for joining and have a great night, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.